within capitalism, corporations, large corporations, long-standing corporations like Norfolk Southern have to be checked. Yeah. And I think what people are saying is our polit many of our politicians, we're not going to condemn every many of our politicians don't have the integrity and the fortitude to check them in the way that they should be checking them. And this is what I agree with democratic socialists about is that when you don't check capitalism in the way and regulate it in the way you need to regulate it, this is what happens. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the, the invisible hand is not the Holy spirit. It's not going to correct itself. It's not going to regulate itself. It's not going to tell itself not to take certain chances. And so you can't leave it by itself. Your eyes on the times, you walk ready to speak up. But with so many problems, you're exhausted trying to keep up. This is the Church Politics Podcast, where you can get political commentary from a biblical worldview. We're not trying to be conservative or progressive. We're trying to be Christian in the public square. And I'm black as heaven. I'm made in God's image. Nobody can change my settings. Amen. Hey man, cut off my knees and put it into my search. It's easy to sell your soul when you don't know what it's worth. With your no good and camp, you're listening to the and campaign's church politics podcast with Justin Gibney, aka Bishop Cooper's grandson, and the Windy City representative, the baddest brother above the Mason Dixon line, my play cousin, the right reverend, Christopher Butler. Chris, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, and we know that uh, we started this journey in uh, Black History Month, but the how I got over docu-series and campaign's original docu-series about the role that the authority of scripture played in the black church the first two episodes are out right now so if you haven't seen that and i'm 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 feeling like a lot of y'all who listen to this podcast already have seen it if you haven't seen it i'm questioning your uh your love for this podcast <laughs> but if you have not seen it you need to go check it out where do you go check it out you want to go to andcampaign.org slash register once you register for our new newsletter which will be coming out in about a month and a half or about a month um then you will get automatically get to see those first two episodes there's three other episodes coming but those first two episodes are already out the the one that just came out about a week or so ago stars yours truly the right reverend christopher butler so if it wasn't enough for you to see the first one the second episode it's starring Christopher Butler, and so y'all need to go check it out. Any thoughts about uh, why folks should go check out that How I Got Over docu Chris? It's certainly not starring me, uh, but it does have uh, a lot of really dynamic people, and it's just it's just really, really, really well done. I mean, been part of uh, putting it together. You know, you you hope and anticipate that it's going to be right. But sitting and watching it, I can tell you, it's just really well done. It's, it, and it's the kind of content that you're not going to find uh, in other places. So I really urge people uh, to go check it out. It's, it's very informative, really well put together. Shout out to uh, you, Justin, and to the, the whole team that put the thing together. It's really dynamic. Yeah, for real. Shout out to uh, Yvette Broughton and uh, Purple Sky. Also shout out to Dr. C.J. Rhodes, who's the other executive producer uh, we took, man, a year and a half, almost two years to get this done. Really put a lot of time and work into it. A lot of theology, a lot of thought. Please go check that out again on the Ann Campaign website. You can go to annecampaign.org slash register. As always, you know, we got to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, the Fetzer Institute, for supporting us in what we do and how we do it. We also want to thank all of you out there who go on patreon.com slash church politics and give. Uh, we we appreciate you giving to this because we can't create this type of content without you. So thank you for that all all that you do. If you want to become a patron, again, just go to patreon.com slash church politics and you actually get premium episodes, right? And so in this next episode, uh, after this episode, we'll be on the Patreon premium uh, to talk about, you know, different policy and what the name of policy has to do with the actual substance of the policy. So go check that out. And if you give, you can do that. But we got a lot of good stuff to talk about today, Chris. So we might as well get into it. Y'all know how it goes. Grab your Bible, get your mind right and prepare to think not like a Republican, not like a Democrat, but like a Christian. 
And let's start with some scripture. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. In other words, Chris, what I think Paul is saying right here is guard your faith from false teaching. And if I were to apply it to the public square, I might might say, don't turn your faith over to Gnostics, Stoics, Epicureans, the enlightened elite, woke identitarians, conservative or progressive tribesmen, partisans, or even those searching for a squishy, neutral middle ground. Again, it says, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Throughout history, Chris, the intelligentsia hasn't gotten every, everything wrong, but they have been proliter- p- p- uh, perennially wrong, I should say, um, especially when it comes to matters of faith and supernatural occurrences. In many instances, these things just seem to be beyond the scope of many in the intelligentsia is understanding. And I want to read you an interesting quote. It says in in an 1822 letter to the physician Benjamin Waterhouse, Thomas Jefferson expressed his confidence that traditional Christianity in the young United States was giving way to a more enlightened faith. Much like Jefferson's own, uh, it rejected the divinity of Jesus Christ. I trust, Jefferson said, that there is not a young man now living in the United States who will not die a Unitarian. Well, history shows us that the Second Great Awakening would dismantle Jefferson's hypothesis. It would inspire a proliferation of new religious groups with supernatural beliefs entirely distant from Jefferson's Enlightenment religion. Those quotes now, that, those two particular quotes came from an article that I read, Chris, in the New York Times by Catholic writer Ross Austin. If you've been listening to this show from any time, you know that we uh, have gone over several of his articles. I think he's, he's pretty thoughtful. But this particular article was entitled, Why You Can't Predict the Future of Religion. And what I think we can learn from Thomas Jefferson's quote, uh, and what it really should show a lot of people, is that Folks have been pronosticating about the death of Christianity since it's, since it came about, right? And so one thing we can take from that is that your concerns about Chris- Christianity probably aren't as new or original as you think. And Douthat reminds us that religious history is shaped as much by sudden eruptions as it is by, uh, by long trajectories, as much by mystical and per- by the mystical and personal as by the institutional and sociological. He says that when it comes to the religious future, you should follow the trends, but but also always expect the unexpected, recognizing that every organized faith could disappear tomorrow and some spiritual encounter would resurrect religion soon enough. I think those are wise words. I thought this was just an interesting article A lot of what the article was talking about was uh, the revival that was going on in Asbury, Kentucky, uh, and how people are, you know, kind of uh, dealing with that uh, and how we should interpret that, uh, along with, again, all these projections about uh, where Christianity going or where where it isn't going. And I think there's an application here, too, just in the public square, because I sometimes, Chris, I get the feeling that a lot of Christians in the public square are kind of hedging their bets. Mm-hmm. Um, are kind of trying to save themselves just in case Christianity fizzles out as some have predicted. You know, the folks who kind of say, you know, if this Christianity thing doesn't work out, Chris, yeah. let me make sure that I'm on the right side of history. I'll call myself a Christian, but let me make sure that I don't take any positions that might make my colleagues or my peers look at me crazy. Um, And from what I can tell, when it comes to a lot of our peers, the cynics and the prophets of doom and gloom for Christianity have gotten into their head. I think we need to really check our faith. We need to do as Paul was telling Timothy to do. 
We need to guard the deposit that's been entrusted to us because there's always a philosophy. There's always uh, a new ideology that wants the allegiance and the faith that we give Christianity to be its own. And so there's always going to be things vying for that faith. But we have to truly believe because, again, I mean, the words that we saw from Thomas Jefferson were so powerful. He was convinced. And whether you like him or not, I have a lot of issues with him. He was convinced that Christianity was over. And he couldn't have been more wrong. Um, And we know if we look throughout the Bible, if we look throughout history again, that God changes things in ways that we don't even expect. So we can have plans and we can strategize, Chris. But at the end of the day, it, it's it's all in God's hands. Now, I will point this out when it was, well, a lot of folks have been talking about the uh, Asbury revival. And I think that's good. Uh, some folks have been a little shaky about it because we talk about these great awakenings, but we don't mention things like the Azusa Street revival. And I was happy to see, Chris, that Douthat did mention the, the Azusa Street revival. He said this. He said, arguably, the most important movement within global Christianity today exists because of a revival that began with an African-American preacher and his followers praying together in a shabby part of Los Angeles in in 1906. That African-American preacher, just in case you didn't know, is William J. Seymour, a Mm one-eyed exhorter who was able to bring an interracial congregation together for worship. And as you as you saw, one of the biggest revivals uh, that there ever was. And if you want to learn more about William J. Seymour. He is talked about in the first episode of how I got over. But Chris, just to pass it back to you, you know, you got to put in the uh, shameless plug. <laughs> but just to pass it back to you, Chris, what, what were your thoughts on this article and just our ability or others predi- ability to predict what's going to happen with Christianity? You know, I was very uh, grateful for the article, obviously, as a, you know, a um, a, a preacher in and, and the lineage of, of Seymour, very happy for uh, that shout out. Um, but I think this is, is so important for us in the public square uh, because, you know, I think the first thing we, we look at or need to look at that we often forget is that spiritual awakening impacts political realities. Um, and all of the things that we seem to struggle for or struggle against in civics and in politics. Um, it may seem sometimes that we're not making much progress, uh, but if we understand and hold out hope for this reality of God that I think you can look back over the ages and see um, that God will do unexpected things uh, through in unexpected places uh, through unexpected people. Um, I always point to, uh, uh, even once in, in preaching through, um, the, the kind of old Testament narrative, uh, books. I think when you, when you look at those books, uh, Ruth and, uh, so on, that's, that's essentially like for me, like the high theme of those books is that God is sovereign and works through, unexpected people in obscure places to do uh, incredible things that shift the literal course of history, right? Um, And so this is a reality that is, uh, it is ages old. uh, And I think it is a reality of God. And if it is a reality of God, and we believe in God, uh, then we have to hold out hope uh, for some type of spiritual uh, revival that can't impact the the political realities. Um, I think right alongside that, we have to hold on to the testimony of the Hebrew boys, right? Like there's always the but if not, that has to be there, right? Like, yeah, God can do anything. Um, but even if, if he doesn't, even if we just get consumed in the fire, I'm still not going to bow. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's an important element, but that's, that's, that's one thing to keep you going. It's like the, but if not, but sometimes I think we lose grasp of this more hopeful, uh, approach to continuing to, uh, to struggle, to make strides and to believe, uh, which is that this understanding that God can and will do, uh, incredible things through things that we don't even know anything about. And uh, that's that's the last piece I'll say. Probably the 
the thing I, I most disliked about the uh, the visitation, the revival that was taking place at Asbury um, is the way I learned about it, which was through social media. Um, and while I'm glad I, I know about it and was able to see some things about it, something in me really wishes that I was able to hear about it from some friend of mine who heard about it some from some friend of theirs who went there and experienced it uh, rather than it becoming more of a kind of social media uh, and media phenomenon. Because I think what happens with social media and kind of 24-hour news cycle is that we are sort of deceived uh, into thinking that we know that and, and that we need to know uh, everything uh, that is happening with everyone everywhere all the time. Um, but that's deception. Uh, if we isolate ourselves to what we know is happening in the world, um, we, we, can, we can begin to discount the possibility of what God is doing. So, um, you know, I, I always I try to remind myself when, whenever I do, and, and I think I do face those moments of despondency where it's like, man, it's just a fear of us out here struggling and everybody, you know, are, is, you know, just turned to the way of the world and there's nobody faithful uh, in the church. Um, I, I remind myself of uh, Elijah, the prophet, when uh, King Ahab and Jezebel are trying to kill him. Uh, and he says to God in, uh, I think, chapter 19 uh, of Kings, he says something to God along the lines of, you know, I've been faithful, but the whole nation has turned against you. Uh, they've killed all the prophets and nobody's faithful but me. Um, and God gives him instruction to go and anoint a king, anoint uh, Elisha as his prophetic follow up. Uh, but then he, he says to him at the end of those instructions um, that I'm going to preserve 7,000 because I got 7,000 people in this nation. You're saying you're the only one. I got 7,000 in the nation that have not bowed the knee uh, to Baal or given Baal a kiss. Um, and I try to remind myself of that, that there are things and people in the world and in this country that God is working in, working with, working through that I don't know anything about. Um, and so my job is to stay on my square and be faithful where I am um, and allow for God to do these incredible things that we can't calculate in our strategies uh, and institutional efforts. Yeah. And, and where's your treasure? Right. Because at the end of the day, if your treasure is here, if your treasures in your career, if your treasures in anything that you can receive here on Earth, you're going to make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. Right. You're going to be either impatient, afraid, whatever you want to call it and yeah. say, hey, man, let me hedge my bets and throw my hands up because this doesn't look like it's going well. Therefore, let me stay out of the fray. Let me get out of the way. Yeah. Um, and I think over and over and over. And this is why we need to stay in our Bibles over and over and over again. God tells us, Jesus tells us that that's not just that's just not an option. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clearly a matter of faith how we feel about the majority of society and what they think is going to happen to Christianity is a matter of faith. Yeah. Um, and I think we have, you know, I think there's a lot of history that's supportive of what we're saying too. And that's why we gave you some of the history, but at the end of the day, if you don't feel like that's enough, it's a matter of faith and, and you've got to, you've got to deal with that. I like what you said about these revivals and, you know, God just reviving his people coming from unlikely sources because William J. Seymour for a lot of folks would have been the most unlikely source, especially around that time. Yeah. Right. Like who would have expected it to come from him in LA at that time, which I mean, you know, yeah. the, the, the other awakenings weren't anywhere near LA um, in an in, in a racial group. Now that we know mm -hmm. things happened to that group afterwards, but no one would expect it would have expected that to happen. And I think whenever there's a big move like that, that's, you know, that's uh, can be that it, the way that it goes. And so we we have to live, leave space for that, yeah. leave space to understand that we're not going to be able to predict exactly how this is going to look. Now, one thing I do want to point out um, that that was somewhat ironic to me uh, about when I read the article that that I kind of thought about was 
many of the same Christians or maybe they're former Christians now who find themselves siding with kind of the secular progressive ideology over the faith, or at least over the traditional faith. Now, as a consequence, have to come out against the authority of scripture Mm -hmm. and would also be the same ones who would have a lot of issues with Thomas Jefferson and want to tear down anything in society, American society that has the founders that has anything to do with the founders. Right. Like a lot of people find themselves in that space. Mm -hmm. But I noticed those same people use the same enlightenment framework to go against Christianity as Thomas Jefferson did. Yeah. So you have people who really dislike everything that the founders stood for, but use the same tools and the same framework to go against the faith as he did. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't even know that the, and we talk about this quite a bit, but a lot of people don't even know that the foundation of that kind of secular progressive enlightenment point of view is the same place that Jefferson was, was going right. Is the same, is the same kind of Western uh, group of thought. And a lot of these people would never want to admit that they were following the same thing or that the core of their philosophy or their new theology was the same one as some of the founders who they dislike. And so that, that was interesting to me. Any thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah, no, I, I, I thought about that uh, probably a, a little bit in the inverse because those, those, that same crowd would also um, probably be moving more towards some kind of um, spiritualism uh, that they think is like connecting, you know, with the ancestors and what have you, uh, and totally discounting, uh, the, the, the spiritual legacy of black people in America and African peoples, uh, as it's, re- as it relates to biblical Christianity. Um, I always, you know, I said this in, in my sermon, I did my black history sermon last week. Uh, and I said, you know, you always have to remember that the oldest, Black history text uh, that we have available to us is the Bible, right? Um, you know, and and so when when you disconnect from the Bible uh, and Christian, especially these kind of like revivals and, and more kind of uh, spiritual movements uh, within Christianity, you're disconnecting yourself uh, from uh, a, a major heritage of, of Black peoples uh, in the world. Uh, and in this country. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something about some, some real theological failures, I think, and not just on the part of people who are leaving uh, and have left the church. I also say that we got to do a better job of that within the church to make sure that we put those theological realities out there for people uh, and, and live them a little bit more forward um, so that folks can understand that when when you when you're moving away from the Bible for kind of Western enlightenment, you're not moving from whiteness to blackness. You're moving from blackness to whiteness. Now, if that's what you want to do, do your thing. But it should be understood. Right, right. And I mean, and and of course, you you, you know, you're not saying that the Bible is just about black people or anything like that. Not at all. But there's a heritage, there's a legacy that's connected to it within our tradition that you're walking away from. And and people need to be honest about that. There's not a lot of intellectual honesty about where certain philosophies come from and all that. And I think as Christians, we do have to be honest about it. And somebody might be asking, well, what does all this have to do with politics? Well, in in my mind, how we think about our faith, where we think our faith is going, what we think God is capable of doing or will do is always going to be reflected in our public witness. Yeah. It's always going to be reflected how we engage others, how we engage other philosophies and ideologies. What's where's, where's our confidence in who we are and what we represent and where we're going and what we're here for. So it's a matter of purpose. It's a matter of uh, what we think, eschatology will look like Mm -hmm. um and we need to consider all those things as we move forward because again it is part of our public witness i'll go ahead and close this out chris yeah no i i I think that the the theological impacts the political um whether you're coming from a christian framework or not really what you think about who who we are where where people come from and where humanity is going um impacts how you kind of like approach moral decisions, which is 
a lot of what we do, I would argue all of what we do in politics. That's real. Uh, we've we said for a long time that theology matters to the AND campaign. And whatever we do and whatever we say is rooted in our orthodox theology. Um, and it was, you know, again, this was one of those episodes, Chris, that was actually hard to choose what to touch on because there was mm -hmm. all there was definitely going to be something that we didn't touch on that folks will be hitting us up and asking us why we didn't cover it. We only have so much time. But um, as many of you, I'm sure, know by now or you have heard a Norfolk Southern train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, uh, spilling toxic chemicals all around and understandably scaring the town's 4,700 residents who are very much concerned about the long-term health consequences of this spill. Now, it's being said that state and federal officials are saying that they haven't detected any dangerous levels of the chemicals in the air, although if you go there, it's said that you could smell the chemicals in the air. They're saying it's not dangerous levels uh, and that those dangerous levels also aren't in the municipal water, okay? Now, even though we have some experts saying that, other experts are saying, well, it's just too soon to know. We haven't had enough time to really test. And so let's not take those results too far. But one thing we do know is that headaches, coughs, skin irritation, and things like that have been reported from the residents. And one of the substances that was leaked, which is vinyl chloride, can cause dizziness, headaches, drowsiness with short-term exposure, but also can cause a rare form of liver cancer after chronic exposure. And so one thing I feel about this and how these things tend to happen, unfortunately, Chris, is you really don't know until years later. Mm -hmm. And the way that you deal with it years later is going to be a lot different than you would deal with it now. But I hope we don't allow Norfolk Southern, uh, the administration or anybody else to kick this can down the road. And then when something pops up later on, people don't feel it as much because it's it's been gone for so long. I mean, the, the people who live in that you, that town will feel it, but mm -hmm. it's not at the top of everybody's list. Um, now, one of the things that people are saying is that, you know, I, I guess there was something wrong with the brakes and it was, you know, a whole bunch of stuff was going on miles uh, ahead of time that they just couldn't stop. And eventually this thing goes off the rails and a lot uh, uh, of chemicals are spilled and you can smell it and all that stuff. So here's some, but Chris, here's some criticisms of the response to this that I've seen. And so I want to go over some of those criticisms. Um, some would say that the Biden administration, namely the transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, who's been talked about quite a bit as of late because there's been a lot of mishaps when it comes to transportation in America. But a lot of people are saying that they were playing politics and they took far too long to go to East Palestine and see what was going on and talk to the people and things like that. And then one thing I did notice is that when Buttigieg finally got down there, he plays the helpless role as if you're not a part of the executive branch, as if you don't have any power to change anything. He's he's telling the companies to stop fighting them. He's no do what you have to do right to make this better. I hate when people who are in power act like it's somebody else stopping them from exercising their power. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a different subject. The next thing I've, I've heard is that after this all happened. They fixed the tracks pretty quickly so that other trains could start running again without thoroughly cleaning up. So th there seemed to be what some would say a rush to get things moving again without necessarily even taking the time to make sure that the cleanup was thorough, like putting tracks back over what could be tainted soil. If that's the case, that's a problem. Here's something else, and this might be one of the worst of them. Norfolk Southern ran most of the test after the spill instead of the EPA. So most of that work, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, was done by Norfolk Southern and the people that they brought in or paid for or whatever, which left many people asking, why should we trust them to report accurately on themselves, to tell on themselves? If, if, Chris, if, if you're charged with a crime... I'm not going to ask you to go to the crime scene and collect evidence. Yeah. It's not that I don't trust you, Chris, but you might be confronted with a sort of conflict of interest. <laughs> and for, and and so many people are saying for this to even happen, it's just incompetence. Like they, they can do their own tests if they want to, but certainly 
as a government, and I'm not saying the government is fully depending on their tests, but as I understand it, they are, uh, when they speak on it, they were leaning on some of those tests and some of those tests were, were more in depth than the test that the EPA did itself. If that's the case, that is problematic. Again, this is one of those, and even a lot of the residents were saying, Chris, there's so much information out there. People are saying so many things. It's hard to tell what's actually, actually happening. Now, for us, that's an inconvenience. For them, that's a, a major problem, right? Um, and then one other thing is people have been saying over the years, our government has continually reduced railroad standards when it comes to regulation and that they've done this at the behest of railroad lobbyists. And eventually we get to this point. Now, initially, people were saying these this deregulation that came from Trump is the reason why this happened. I also saw an article in Washington Post that says that's not the case. You're hearing so many different conflicting things. It's hard to know exactly what to believe. But what we want to give you is just kind of a, a variety of what's being said and then keep keep up with this uh, so that we can get down to what's actually going on there. Yeah. But Chris, let me tell you what I think the overriding issue is with me. And this connects to some of the things that we've been talking about for a few weeks. I have very little confidence that Norfolk Southern and just American business culture in general, not everybody, but American business culture in general, especially when we're talking about these mega companies. I have very little confidence that they have the integrity, the honor or the sense of obligation to do what's right by the people when that conflicts with the money bag. Yep. I just don't trust that they'll say, man, we could really increase these dividends for our shareholders or or we got to make sure that we don't get too close to the, to the line of what's actually safe. I don't believe that they make the right decision when it comes to that. I don't believe that we put enough incentive. I don't believe that the the punishments are high enough for them to make the right choices with that. Uh, because when I look at it and you look at some some of the things that have happened even recently, it seems like for too long, it's been all about lowering costs. Yep. It's all about becoming as efficient as possible. It's all about the bottom line, even when that puts lives at risk down the road. I hope I'm wrong, but in too many cases, that seems like what is being prioritized. I have very little faith also that our politicians and our administrators are willing to stand up to lobbyists, are willing to stand up to people who could later be funding their campaigns, put the clown show aside, and prioritize the people in the long term. Now, certainly when things blow up, blow up, everybody's trying to do the right thing and, and uh, you know, everybody's a hero. But what about what happens leading up to this? The lobbying, the, you know, the conversations, the, the fundraising cash. What do we do then? Or do we just become these uh, enlightened, benevolent people once something bad happens? Chris, go ahead and speak into this, please. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it's funny because we, um, you know, we, we don't compare notes uh, before we do the podcast. Um, and it, it's almost like you were like reading directly off my notes um, because I, I, I do think that that's that's the core of the issue here right like um over time we have um shifted from being a a kind of democratic society that plays host to a capitalist um economy to being a capitalist society that plays host to a um you know, at, at least uh, nominally democratic uh, form of government. And that has to be reversed back uh, because the reason this situation is fraught is because people don't know if they can trust the, the, the company um, and they don't know if they can trust the government to protect them from the company. Um, and, and I can tell you, I have uh, firsthand experience with this particular company, uh, Norfolk Southern uh, Railway, the, the church that I pastor, uh, went through a, a very difficult uh, season because the community where the church was located um, in Inglewood in Chicago, uh, Norfolk Southern moved into that neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, 
worked with, I, I, I would say colluded with, but I don't want to be, you know, uh, sued or nothing like that. Uh, so I, I I'll say worked with, uh, in, in quotes, um, local politicians to displace over 400 families. Um, most of them didn't get nearly what they should have gotten for uh, their homes that were taken through uh, eminent domain. Uh, we had to organize to uh, to get the last few holdouts uh, adequate uh, remuneration for their homes, uh, and and it just it was a fight the entire way. Uh, we witnessed uh, Norfolk Southern saying that they weren't doing things that folks in the community absolutely knew that they were doing, that they were not doing things that we absolutely knew that they were doing. Um, there's a documentary about this. Uh, it's called The Area. You can go check that out because uh, they, they really document at least the last end of this, this fight and this process. And so when you go through something like that with a company and then that same company is telling you, oh, yeah, you know, we, we looked over things and we cleaned it up and we did as best as possible. And nobody's in any danger. It's just hard to believe. Um, you know, I've seen uh, this company put uh, its profits over people. Uh, I've seen how this company can use its money uh, to influence uh, elected officials. Norfolk Southern has put $100 million over 30 years directly into campaigns, $800 million into lobbying uh, over the last 30 years. So that's right close to a billion dollars that this one company has spent um, in our politics. And so my firsthand experience says if it's people or profit, this company is going to choose profit. Um, my, my firsthand experience and, and this, uh, the implication of the money that they spent in politics says that it is going to be difficult for uh, elected officials to jump in. Uh, and then you layer on top of that for this East Palestine uh, event, the fact that you have a Democratic administration um, and a very Republican area. And, you know, you would hate to think that any slowness in response had anything to do with politics. And I, I don't even think I really was thinking that, Justin, until I saw Nina Turner get so roundly criticized. I mean, this is Nina Turner. If people listen here don't know Nina Turner, I mean, she's about as progressive as progressive can get. And she made a comment that working people in East Palestine, Ohio, don't deserve uh, to be treated badly by a company or the government just because they voted for Donald Trump. Yeah, and uh, I think she was responding, to, and I'm going to give it back to you. I think she was responding to Joy Behar on The View, who basically mm -hmm. was like, these people voted for Trump, therefore they got what they deserve. deserve. Yeah. And, and, and folks, a lot of folks on the left, like, came at her for making what seems like... A, in a very recent past, like that would be like a fairly innocuous uh, thing to say. Um, but, you know, it, 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 that did give me a little bit of pause to say, man, I, were politics part of how the response uh, w was coordinated? W w we don't know. But I think I'll, I'll just close with going back to the first piece, which is I think that the reason the whole situation is fraught is because people don't have that kind of deep-seated confidence that they can trust the corporation or that they can trust the government to protect them from the corporation. And, yeah. and that part's got to be fixed. Within capitalism, corporations, large corporations, long-standing corporations like Norfolk Southern have to be checked. Yeah. And I think what people are saying is, our poli many of our politicians, we're not going to condemn every, many of our politicians don't have the integrity and the fortitude to check them in the way that they should be checking them. And this is what, you know, in a, to a certain extent, this is what I agree with democratic socialists about, is that when you don't check capitalism in the way and regulate it in the way you need to regulate it, this is what happens. Yep. Right? Yep. I mean, the, the the invisible hand is not the Holy Spirit. It's not going to correct itself. It's not going to regulate itself. It's not going to tell itself not to take certain chances. And so you can't leave it by itself. Now, I say that, and I also say, I think 
democratic socialists would then say give everything to the government and i don't know that that's i don't know that yeah. that's going to be a much better solution i don't know that the railway would have been maintained better or those or or uh um they would have been forced to be regulated for safety more just because the government controlled everything i, I don't know that that uh corresponds but we do have to have these checks and we do have to have politicians that can say yeah you might have donated to me but there are some things that are off limits. Safety is off limits. And I'm not going to do everything that I can to make sure that you get every single dollar that you can when while putting the American people at risk. And I just don't have enough confidence that we have the leaders to do that right now. Yeah, and it's really I sad. I don't think so. And I don't, I don't know how we get there. I mean, this is a conversation for a, a, another podcast, but I, I don't know. I don't know how we get to this the point that I know we need to get to, at least I think we need to get to. Um, but I don't know that we'll have those type of leaders as long as these corporations are allowed to spend unlimited amounts of money in our politics. Yeah. Um, because as long as, yep. As long as they're allowed to spend unlimited amounts of money and we're more worried about what party somebody's in, what color they are, what gender they are, and ain't paying no attention to the content of people's character, what they're actually doing, who they're willing yeah. to stand up against. And that's every single one of us listening to this, even myself. As long as we're primarily concerned about that, you're not going to check nobody because as soon as you try to check them, they're going to say who's being racist to them or they're going to yeah. say what the other parties are doing or they're going to say who's sexist or they're going to say who's unpatriotic and they got y'all worried about everything but the substance of what they're getting done while almost everybody in Congress somehow becomes rich once they right. go to once they go to Congress and the Senate. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't see that. We're more worried about the... Uh, externals man well let me say this I, you know too little too late you you tell me but perhaps i'm being a little too pessimistic because there is some movement right uh legislation was introduced by ohio senators uh sherrod brown uh, who's a democrat and also jd vance who's a new uh republican senator in ohio and with four other senators wednesday it is called the railway safety act and it would bolster a slew of railroad safety measures, including raising fines for safety infractions, increasing inspections, and imposing new requirements for trains carrying toxic or hazardous materials. I'm happy this is being done. Have no idea why it's just being done now. From what I understand, Chris, and you correct me, there's been another train that derailed in Ohio. Yep. Um, to me, all of this was predictable, but who cares what's predictable when you can uh, maximize profits? Go ahead and take us out, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think that that legislation is great. Um, I am very skeptical about, you know, whether they can get the additional six Republican senators that will be required to uh, pass that legislation through the Senate um, or get you know, a broad enough majority of Democrats and Republicans to pass it in the House. Um, President Biden has said that he would sign it uh, if it came. Um, but these, this corporation individually, then you have to think about the larger uh, kind of railroad companies as a sector, and then the implications more broadly for corporate power. Um, you know, it's, it, is, it is terribly fraught. Uh, the the entire process. Um, I, I, I'm grateful for that legislation, um, and and I'm hopeful that this whole situation serves as just another inflection point to highlight um, this great tension in our politics right now um, with the just way 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 too much corporate influence and corporate power in our government and in our um, in our culture in general. And we, we have to find ways to do something about that in our generation. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, one thing that really stuck with me that GK Chesterton used to say is that you can't let corporations nor the government have too much power. Both of them have to be checked. Yeah. And I think we see in this instance right here, when capitalism, when corporations aren't checked, Really what happens when, when we have leaders or representatives who aren't doing their job, this is where we're left. Well, uh, there's been some interesting things going on in, in D.C. Chris's progressive Democratic friends are not very happy <laughs> with President Biden. 
according to them, Biden is siding with Republicans to shut down the effort of local leaders in uh, D.C. to update their criminal code. It might not be that quite that simple, though. Surprise, surprise. Right. The code updates don't even have full support of all the local leaders in D.C., right, which we know is, is dominated by Democrats. The most notable opponent of the criminal code uh, revisions is D.C.'s mayor, Muriel Bowser, uh, who obviously is not a Republican. She's a Democrat, a well-known Democrat. Uh, and in fact, D.C.'s city council had to override her veto um, to get this proposal through this year. OK, so it's not something that everybody was on board with. And now it's just Republicans who are trying to stop it. That's not to say this is right. I'm just saying it's a little more complicated than some folks are presenting it in the media. What Bowser is saying she has a problem with is uh, the lowering of some of the maximum sentences and increasing the number of jury trials. She thinks that this will end up letting more people free, giving people lower sentences, and they just go out and commit crimes. And we know there is a way. So one of the things <laughs> the left is saying is, hey, why Biden, why are you hoping the Republican narrative that there's this crazy crime wave? And it's like, well, the crime wave is there. I don't, I don't think this is about supporting a narrative. The other thing people were saying is, hey, this is a 100-year-old um, criminal code. Like, it's, it's just out of date. And so I think the question is not how old it is or that it may need to be changed to some extent. It's the substance of the changes, right? Now, what I want you guys to keep in mind is, unlike other jurisdictions or other what we would call states, the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the right to control D.C., right? Now, some people would say this that this flies in the face of what we would call home rule. And what home rule says is that localities, cities, towns, states, whatever, ought to be able to govern themselves and shouldn't be over overridden by the federal government or even state governments if you're talking about local stuff. That local solutions, that local solutions should be made for local issues, not federal solutions for local issues. Uh, and this is where people have the most control in their localities and we don't need people stepping in to change what the people actually want and are more directly appealing to okay uh chris what were your thoughts on this back and forth i thought it was interesting again as usual and i hope you guys realize this most of these conversations are going to be a little more complicated than what's presented and i and i definitely wanted to point that out but go ahead chris now i mean the 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 president found himself as my granny would say caught between a rock and a hard place um because there is, you know, as part of kind of like Democratic Party platform, the idea of D.C. statehood is in there. Um, and along with that is the idea of, of D.C. autonomy, uh, even in the absence currently of statehood. And so if you believe in autonomy for D.C., um, you have to leave their legislative decisions alone. I mean, the mayor vetoed the bill. The council was able to get enough votes to override that veto for something that, you know, the, my, you know, somewhat cursory, not exactly cursory, but not fully detailed, but my look at the bill, I think it is a, a bad bill, um, but they got the votes for it and they overwrote the mayor's veto and that's how they want to roll. I think uh, Mayor Bauer and President Biden are looking to places like where I'm sitting in Chicago and saying, you know, we don't want to be the next Lloyd Lightfoot because the, you know, the left can call this Republican narrative um, all you want to, you know, hit hit me up on 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 Twitter. I will send you video of. Um, you know, teenagers, young adults having a party standing on top of my car. And I called the police six times and nobody ever came. Uh, so if, if, if there's a person like the people who are living in these cities don't see Republican narrative when they talk about crime, when you hear somebody talk about crime, you really like this is your lived experience. Um, and so, you know, Democrats can continue to call this crime issue Republican narrative if they want to. 
Bauer and Biden see that this is costing votes um, and they try to respond to that. So you don't want to be Lori Lightfoot, but then, you know, in order to not be Lori, Lori Lightfoot, now you have to step away from the whole DC autonomy piece is, is one of those pieces where, you know, he, he wow. couldn't make a right decision here. Um, maybe he made the most right decision that he can. I don't know. Uh, I, I would just, I would, I would hate to be in that spot. It, it just highlights this. Um, I think a significant splinter. I don't want to call it a splintering, but it's a significant issue inside of the democratic coalition. Um, because folks who want to go along with the democratic party on a lot of things, I don't think will go along with the the far left of the party that wants to make like uh, like police officers arresting people and prosecutors prosecuting people is fundamentally unjust. Um, right. I don't think the the majority of of folks, even inside the Democratic Party, are going to go with that ever. In the narrative, and here's a crazy part. Now, I just gave the progressive left a compliment, at least half of a compliment, uh, last segment. But I got to say, this all grows out of, again, the defund the police ideology or way of thinking. So now in order to make that make sense, in order to make that ideological conclusion make sense and right, now you have to tell people who are living in these areas that the crime is a figment of their imagination. Yeah. That the crime is really just something that Republicans made up and it's really not that bad or really even happening. Mm -hmm. And then... What was intellectually honest, uh, dishonest about this was that to say this is Biden siding with Republicans when you got a Democratic mayor and other people within the city. It wasn't just the mayor. Other people in the city said, no, this is not a good idea. The prosecutor, yeah. other folks are like, please don't do this. And you make it a, you make it partisan. But guess what? We eat it up. And so I guarantee you there's some people out there on Twitter talking about this, talking about how Biden sold out and don't even know that it's a much more complicated matter. Yeah. Democrats, one of the things I think threatening them, threatening them most is their ability to govern in in, in localities mm -hmm. when it comes to crime. Yeah. Is their ability to, to sell some of the folks in the activist class? No, you're wrong. What you're saying makes no sense. And I'm not going to get people hurt to pursue this fantasy and this utopia that you're talking about. Until Democrats can do that and progressive executives executives can do that. They're going to have a major problem until yeah. they can do it without being, without being ashamed or trying to hide and say, no, this is what has to happen because the statistics are what they are talking to the people out there. They're afraid this crime is out of control and we're just, and you're just emboldening people that have bad intentions. Yeah. You don't have to deal with that. Um, I am usually a home rule person. Uh, and so I get where that's coming from. And we know there's just political, as you, you hit it on the head, it's just political implications. There's 2024 implications when it comes to this conversation. And Biden's like, yeah, y'all are whine for a second. You'll get over it. But you don't want to get your head knocked off in 2024 when crime goes up or something happens crazy in D.C. And it's going to come back on us because we had control to do something. We didn't do it. Yeah, and he he has to even even though the the other political implication that I think is worthy of a little bit of discussion is why can why can't the Democratic president of the United States win a vote in city council in Washington D.C. I mean, like that's that's the part that if 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 I'm like a a super hardcore Democrat Democratic partisan. I'm I'm going crazy about because you can't just send as Republicans right right here in Chicago. There have been like article after article saying that like it was the Republicans that threw Lori Lightfoot out of office. It's like, bro, like this is Chicago. Yeah, what are you talking <laughs> like, about? Right. Show me the last Republican candidate in any race that got fifty percent of the vote in the city of Chicago. Majority of people said no to Lori Lightfoot. That means that it wasn't Republicans. A lot of Democrats and also said no. And that and that's, you know, and it's good to hear the people speak, but I would wonder how many of the, the people just your average regular people in D.C. actually voted to get some of these folks in who would vote to change the criminal code in a way that just doesn't make sense. 
we know the you know you're going to have higher levels of voting come from coming from the more progressive professional class mm-hmm. and if they're if they're voting a lot more than other folks then you get these folks who have unrealistic policies who aren't actually representing the people but the people got to come out and vote um and so we'll, we'll see what happens yeah well i think they 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 have pulled or are trying to pull uh the legislation um ahead of the uh you know the the federal government uh, having to take the vote uh to to pull it back so it it may you know ultimately end up that that biden comes out looking looking good on this one because he won't actually have to do the deed himself it looks like they might pull it back but um this crime question is something that democrats are going to have to get better with and we only have you know a few months before the election of 2024 is in full swing so it's not a lot of time yeah, and and again, this is one of those things where you can blame everything on the other side, but when people are really living it, they're not going to buy it. And and I, and I always tell our audience, be very careful when somebody does something wrong or somebody's in a, a bad position to let them scapegoat the other side or just bring the other side in to change the whole conversation. Let's look at the merits of what's going on and not just lean on identities, parties, and all that other stuff, all right? Well, I hope y'all enjoyed this episode. Uh, certainly enjoy going back and forth with Chris. We still got some talking to do. So, so for those of y'all that are patrons, uh, we got a premium episode coming up that we're about to record now. For everybody else, you know it's all love. And camp, there's a cross that neither political conservatism nor progressivism is fit to bear. There's a civic hearing in need of faithful witnesses who love social justice and won't surrender the truth to be loved by the world. Politic with the boldness and compassion of Jesus Christ. Until next time, Ann Kemp, I'll holla at you. Amen.